Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, August 30th. We're picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 25, really right about to verses 26, 27. We're just quick, quick little review. On um, verse 26, we have that uh, um, Esau was already born, already named Esau, or Esau in our English, which meant hairy because he was hairy. And then Yaakov in 26 is born, his brother catching the heel of Esau. They were born so quick in succession, usually there's a little time in between. There was no time in between. It was as if giving birth to one long baby, but it really was two babies. And um, rightfully named then as they did, as often was the custom, heel catcher. Um, or the, the other word that is translated supplanter meant under the sole of. He was under the sole of Esau's foot. It didn't mean supplanter as a negative like it's come to mean. Esau gives it that twist in scripture and it goes on from there, but the original meaning when we go back to the languages, it did not have the negative connotation. We looked at why that was important last week, so I won't go into more of that now. But we're going to see <coughs> the character of these two boys. They are twins. But that's it. They're separate, <laughs> and they're very different. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, in your own family have either twins or siblings, and you can see that. Sometimes they're complete opposites. Sometimes you find similarities, but a lot of times they're very different, and these two were very different. I should remind us also, because it'll come into play if we get far enough today, that Yitzhak, daddy, Abba, in Hebrew, was 60, six zero years old when the twins were born. So remember they lived longer, he, but it, it surprises us sometimes when we look at these ages. So when the boys grew up, that means in a few words we just covered about 20 years, okay? Boom! <laughs> I know childhood goes fast, but that's awfully fast. But when they grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. What that means is a man knowing game. He was the one that would go out in the field and hunt down game. That was the way that his character was, what he enjoyed. A man of the field is the next descriptive phrase given in the scripture. He would be wandering around out in the fields. Now when we look at those two phrases in scripture often, we have more than one meaning. We, we go into the depth to see. And a hunter in scripture symbolically speaks of roving, it speaks of a restlessness, it, it speaks of a nature that does not know shalom, does not know peace. And that's very fitting in this case, we're going to see that in his character. But let me also show you that, that usually, not always, but usually hunting, or hunter I should say, in scripture has an evil connotation connected with it. Let me give you some examples. Uh, a couple of them you have to see in the King James Version, so I'll read that to you when we get there. But, uh, uh, but not all of them need to be in that way. First, go with me to 1 Samuel 24 and verse 11. 1 Samuel, 1 Shmuel, chapter 24 and verse 11. When we get there, this is one, actually, that, that, that it is the King James that has the word hunter. I'll tell you what it is in New American in a moment. But in the King James, it says, See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I'm guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. These are the words that David, David, was speaking to King Saul. King Saul, um, when he called his father, remember the king took him in to live in the palace with him, like a father. Jonathan, Saul's son, and David were best friends. He was like another son, but Saul, becoming jealous of him, hunted him down. And in the hunting him down, it was to take his life. He tried to kill him in the palace. He missed. He threw his javelin, and he missed. But that's where we see the hunting him down was in a, a bad way. Um, and the, the New American says, you are lying in wait for my life to take it. So we see that's not favorable. Now look at Yaov, Job, Job chapter 10. Job chapter 10 and verse 16. 
and there we read, Should my head be lifted up, you would hunt me like a lion. And again, you would show your power against me. Again, hunting a person, that's, that's a negative, that's not, nothing good can be said of that. Tehillim, Psalm 140 and verse 11. I have no idea why my papers want to blow so much today. Something's angled differently. Psalm 140 and verse 11, where we read, May a slanderer not be established in the earth. May evil hunt the violent man, violent man speedily. So again, since hunting is negative, may the evil ones be hunted down, not those who are of a different caliber. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Oops. Okay. Let me try that one again in my tablet. Sorry. Proverbs chapter 6. Much better, thank you. And verse 26. Proverbs 6 and verse 26. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to loaf of bread, and an adulteress hunts for precious life. The adulteress is on the prey. She is hunting. Micha, Micah, chapter 7 and verse 2. I want you to see it, it, it's the meaning of the word through time, through from the prophets to David to... to uh, um, I guess those are the two examples. Oh, Job was the other that I've given you so far. Micah, Micah, chapter 7, verse 2 says, The godly person has perished from the land. There is no upright person among men. All of them lie in wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the other with a net. So they're hunting other men to kill them. That's, that's horrible. And lastly, let me show you from Ezekiel, Ezekiel, chapter 13. Ezekiel, chapter 13. In verse 18, and this again, I'll read to you from the King James Version where the hunt, word hunting is used, and then I'll tell you what it is in New American. It says, and say, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Woe to the women who sew magic charms on all their wrists and make veils of various lengths for their heads in order to ensnare people. Will you ensnare the lives of my people but preserve your own? And I've missed the verse, the word hunt in there. I thought I had to do the King James in that one. Okay. Well, I've given you enough example. Maybe it comes in the next verse, but you, you hear that. The ensnaring is the hunting. That's the same word in the, the uh, original. The idea, again, is, is evil. They're hunting down people. They're, they're wanting to kill them. They're wanting to trap them and snare them. It has that evil connotation. The opposite that we see is the example that Yeshua gives us. This is in Luke, Luke chapter 13. And in Luke 13, we read a whole different, sorry, go to Luke 19. 13 is not going to have it. Go to Luke 19 and verse 10. And we're going to see in that, for the Son of Man has come to hunt. No, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the opposite, the contrary word to Luke 19 and 10. It's in your cross-references. At least it should be. I believe it is. Okay. Okay. So you see the opposite. The, Lord's, the Spirit of the Lord is to seek in order to save. The spirit of man, when he is hunting, is evil. So when we see that Esau is a hunter, He's a man of the fields. We're getting the idea that his countenance, I shouldn't say countenance, I'm sorry, his character, is not to seek and to save and to help. It's more of that evil type of, um, of bent. Uh, there are only two people in scripture who are called hunters. Esau is one of them, and the other one we already had in Bereshit in Genesis all the way back in chapter 10 and verse 9, and that is Nimrod. And if you remember Nimrod, the very evil line, and it, you know, his his whole line of people were hunters. Were well, they weren't hunters, but they were an evil line. But it said of Nimrod that he was a mighty hunter against the Lord. Your scripture it may say it before the Lord, but the meaning of that word in that time was a mighty hunter against the Lord. So here the idea that I'm going to draw is they're telling us Esau's character. His character was a sportsman. 
his character was a he-man, that his character was not concerned with God or with the things of God. Now, it wasn't that he was the provider for the home and they needed him you know, to go out and get food so we eat. <laughs> no, they had plenty of food. They had plenty of flocks and herds so they could have even had meat easily from their own. It wasn't that they had to hunt down for it. There's no indication that the area was run over by wild beasts and that they needed to beat down the population for the sake of the human beings. You know, no overpopulation, nothing like that. No excuse that we can get to see and say, oh, well, he had a good reason for doing it. You know, and I'm not here to say that you can't eat meat today. I'm not here to argue that point. The point is the way this is being met. And I think we can all identify with it. In today, you'll also see people who are so excited over sports, let's say, or movie stars. You know, the whole world is a different world. That's what I'm trying to say. Esau's world didn't have room for God. It didn't have room for the things of God because we're going to see when we look at his brother, the character is totally different. When it says he's a man of the field, the field meant open country. It would be where wild animals would be. Of course, that's, that's where he's going to go to hunt. But if we look at Matthew 13 and verse 38, in the parables that the Lord is giving there, he says that the field is a representative of the world. And that indicates, again, a, that Esau was a worldly, a fleshly man. He was a rugged, outdoor type. And again, please don't stereotype and, and go away saying that Rochelle says everybody who's rugged and outdoorsy and all of that are evil. I'm not saying that. But the scriptures are giving us that contrast of character with Esau and with his brother. So let's look at his brother. Let's see the, the difference between these two. Okay, and I lost my, there we go, it moved. Whoops, I'm back to Genesis. Genesis. Yes, we're going back to Genesis. And we're the, yes, if you want to read it, you can. I just alluded to it. Do you want to read it loud for us, Patty, since you have it? For the good seed, these are the people who belong to the kingdom, and the weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. Do you have 1338? Oh, 1338. We are going to go back to Genesis. I'm looking up Matthew 13 since, since I have an issue with 13 and verse 38. Okay, I'm not sure what you're reading, Patty. Maybe you're in the wrong chapter because my Matthew 13, 38 says, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, there you go. It's probably in your previous verse. Sometimes the, the verses are not exactly the same because remember the original didn't have verses and chapters. It's one long um, letter. So we put in chapters and verses to help us find our way around to be able to say go to this place because if you went back to the original scrolls that the scriptures were written on take something like Isaiah which we've broken down into 66 chapters if I told you go to the prophet Yeshua's scroll and find for me and I, I want all we like sheep have gone astray well, you know, if you know this chapter, you know right away, oh, that's in chapter 53 and verse 6. So in your Bible, you go real quickly to Isaiah, you go to chapter 53, you go to verse 6, it was very easy. In the scroll, you'd be rolling that scroll looking for where that is, because you wouldn't be able to find where chapter 53 started. And obviously, it's two-thirds of the way through, but that's a long, you know, so we, we made this chapters and verses to help people find their ways around. So sometimes when we do, and especially between the complete Jewish Bible and our English Bibles, sometimes the verses are a little bit off. You know, but it's the same con con context. Boy, I can't talk today. <laughs> Content. It, thank you. Thank you. Content. The, the words are the same. We just we divided them a little differently, you know, is all. So in my New American Standard, it is verse 38. I've got complete Jewish open right here also, and that's verse 38, but still, in another translation, obviously it was a little off. But again, 
Matthew 13, 38 says right in the beginning, and it's the Lord explaining his parable, the field is the world. And that was my point. Esau is out in the world. We all know that we can see someone who is spiritually minded and one who's worldly minded. That's my point. Esau was worldly minded. Okay? Now let's contrast that with his brother. Let's go back to Genesis 25. And let's go on where we left off in verse 27. And we pick up with, but Yaakov was a, and now you may have a civilized man, you may have a quiet man, a plain man, back where we were, chapter 25 and verse 27. Back where, where it, when we're going in order, when I'm not jumping you around. Okay, civilized, plain, quiet, these are the different words that different translations have, have chosen. From our Hebrew, the closest would be a pious, a simple, a quiet, but it's also translated that very same Hebrew word in, uh, in uh, other scriptures. I'll give you those scriptures in a moment as perfect, upright, and complete. Now, it doesn't mean that Yaakov, Jacob, lived a perfect life, that he was a perfect human being. There's only one who gets that, and we know that's Yeshua, Jesus, and in his humanity lived perfectly. But it does mean a mature not carnal, not a playboy, one that is grown in the Lord. That's the identity that we're getting here, undefiled in that sense, that their, their whole focus is the spiritual and it's grown them up in a maturity in the Lord. That's what we're seeing. Let me give you that same Hebrew word in other locations so you see I'm going by the original meanings of these words. We'll stay in Genesis. We'll go back to chapter 6, though. Genesis chapter 6. And I believe it is verse 9. Bereshit, chapter 6, a long time ago when we were there. And verse 9. These are the records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. That word righteous is the same word that we have describing Yaakov right now. The exact same Hebrew word. Chapter 17 and verse 1. Chapter 17, verse 1 of Bereshit of Genesis. Now when Avram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. That's the same word there. God giving Avram commandment to walk in line according to what but God was teaching him and telling him, not according to the world. Another example out of Genesis would be Job. Job, Job chapter 1, and we'll look at verses 1 and 8. There was a man in the name, I'm sorry, a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Blameless, again, the same Hebrew word. Go down to verse 8 in that chapter, and you'll read there. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Yov, Job? For there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Again, it was translated there, blameless. So all those times you saw blameless in this other, it's the same word, that righteous, that living right before God. It's, it's really having a whole heart for the Lord. That's what we are seeing. It's not meaning that any of them lived sinlessly because we know that no one had the ability to, to make it through this human life without sin except for Yeshua in human flesh. Jesus, when he put on the, the human tent, put it that way. But do you notice already such a marked contrast between our two boys? You've got one that's out in the world and that's all his interest is, is worldly and fleshly. And we've got another one who is not rough and, and all of that. He's very quiet. He is upright before the Lord. He has matured in the Lord. His interest is in the spiritual. So we've got two boys out of the same womb, twins born right on top of each other. And yet we have two very different characters, very different. So. Um, oh, and I, I forgot to finish in 27. Jacob was a civilized, a, the, the blameless, all that we just said, man, living in tents. Okay, now contrast that with Esau out in the world. We see what the world represented. 
when we look at tents, who do we know that lived in tents that Yaakov could relate to? Abraham. Very good, Abraham. Abraham, his grandfather, lived in tents all his days. He never settled, um, he never bought a home. <laughs> he bought a cave to bury his wife in, but that's the only property we know of that he bought. He lived a nomadic life, but more importantly, what he was living is a life that, that this earth was not his home. He had his eyes on something else. Hebrews 11 helps us understand that. Hebrews 11 verse 8 says, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance and went out not knowing where he was going. Remember God just told him to go. I have a place for you. I'll show you. Verse 9 says, By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Yitzhak and Yaakov, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Well, where on this earth will you find a city built by God? You won't. You find a city that God chose to put his name on, and that's Yerushalayim. That's in the future that hasn't happened here yet. But you don't find a city here on earth. Abraham was looking to the heavenly home, the new Jerusalem that would be a permanent home for the believers. That's where his eyes were, and it's made clear here that Yitzhak, Isaac, and Yaakov, Jacob, followed in the same suit. So living in tents, scripturally, the idea is they're realizing this world is not their home, and they're not wanting to make this their home. They're traveling through, looking for the home that's been promised them because they're <laughs> men of faith. The spiritual was more important than the fleshly. Now, keep in mind, Yaakov is 15 years old when Abraham dies. So his grandfather easily could have talked to him about the covenant God made with him and could have uh, shared with one like-minded, Yaakov in his heart wanted that too. Wanted that walk with God, wanted to come into the covenant promises with God, wanted to please God, and, and this is what we're seeing in their lives. So I believe scripture is very clear on their characters and especially to see that of Yaakov. Does that mean he didn't make mistakes? No. <laughs> Abraham made mistakes. And he was called a friend of God. And he used his faith as an example. Yitzhak, we're going to see. He was so godly in his upbringing that he was willing to lay down his life with his father, believing that God would resurrect. We saw no rebellion in him. But if we get to our next chap chapter, we're going to see he didn't live perfectly either. Yaakov does not live perfectly. He makes mistakes. We're going to see in chapter 27 what's going on there, but I'm just giving you a preface. Look at his character before you judge him according to what you've heard from around the world. <laughs> Look at what the scriptures say. Take a note from scripture. Verse 28, now Yitzhak, Isaac, loved Esau because he had a taste for gain. Okay, Isaac's loving his son Esau for a very carnal reason. Ooh, I like that wild meat. I like that what you get when you go out hunting. And he probably encouraged him in those activities. Now again, I'm not saying it's wrong that they can't ever go hunt, but to have that be the focal point. To have Isaac feeding that instead of saying, hey, don't, don't be so unbalanced, you know, keep that in perspective. No, it, it really looks like he encouraged him in an irresponsible way. Rebecca, on the other hand, it says in verse 28, yeah, okay, verse 28, but Rebecca loved Yaakov. <laughs> now, we're not told any reason why. Possibly it could be that because she, remember, was a godly woman in her character when she was having that struggle in her womb and didn't know what was going on, she turned to God. We know that, that Yitzhak and I'm sure Rebecca also prayed for her to get pregnant because she didn't get pregnant right away. It was 20 years after their marriage that she found herself with the twins. But she knew what God had told her. 
that one was going to be, the, the younger was going to be the one on top, that the older would serve the younger, and that younger one would be the spiritually minded one, the one that would lead on with the promises that, down to the line of Messiah. So it could be because she knew that God's favor was on Yaakov, that that drew her more to Yaakov than to the he-man Esau. It could be just simply meaning that Isaac and Esau had more in common, that they shared that roughness, and Rebekah and Jacob shared that spiritual, that they talked about God and they shared about God, and maybe she wanted to do that with Esau, but he didn't have an interest in it. We're reading between the lines because we don't really know, but it is interesting that the scripture doesn't give any um, secular reason for why Rebecca loved Jacob, like it does for why Isaac loved Esau. Uh, and by the way, when it uses that word game, he had a taste for game. Some, um, some uh, versions have the word venison, which leads you to think of deer meat, but it probably was the wild mountain goats. Israel's not known for their deer. I think they even say today there's only like maybe a hundred deer in all of Israel. It's not a popular area for deer, so it probably was the wild mountain goats and, and so forth that were being hunted. But the point wasn't what they were hunting. Isaac was proud of his son's athletic prowess. A lot of times we see this, and I'm not picking on men, believe me, we women have our faults too, <laughs> but a lot of times when men have a son that is quiet and meek, a reader, a studier of the Bible, so forth, the father tries to push him outdoors, you know, you need to toughen up, you know, you need to get into sports, you need to do this, you need to do that, and, you know, kind of rough them up so they're man. That, I think, is what we're seeing, that Isaac loved the roughness of Esau, Rebekah loved the quietness and the gentleness, the meekness of Jacob. So two different characters, two different reasons um, for how they, they were viewed by their parents. And I'm not going to read into this and say that that means that Isaac didn't love Jacob and Rebekah didn't love Esau. No. And it's not even necessarily that their favorites were not seeing that either. It's just you gravitate, birds of a feather flock together, and you'll gravitate to those that are more like-minded. And we're going to see that Yitzhak is slipping in his spirituality at this point. I'll prove that as we go on with our story. So, verse 29. <clears throat> when Yaakov had cooked a stew one day, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. Okay, um, that's out of the New American Standard. Um, it's the same thing, pretty close, yeah, in the complete Jewish, so I, I don't think I'm throwing you off with words. If you have the King James, you have the old version, you have the word pottage. What this was, this stew or this pottage, later in the chapter called lentils, which is probably a little more exacting, a lentil soup. Um, a lentil is a legume. But what's interesting is that that's the food for God's prophets. Go with me to 2 Kings. We're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 38 to 40. This is in Elijah's day, Eliyahu. And Elisha, Elisha took the, the mantle from Elijah, asked for a double portion, and he did double the miracles in the way it seems that God was pleased to bless him in that way. So this is after Eliyahu, Elijah has gone to heaven, Elisha is continuing, and he obviously is a leader teaching the others who are also called into the, that, um, I don't want to call it an occupation, God's called them to be prophets for him. It says, when Elisha, Elisha returned to Gilgal, there was a famine in the land. As the sons of the prophets were sitting in front of him, he said to his servant, put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Then one went out into the field to gather mallow and found a wild vine and gathered from its lap full of wild gourds. And he came and sliced them into the pot of stew because they did not know what they were. 
So they poured it out for the men to eat. But as they were eating the stew, they cried out and said, You man of God, there's death in the pot. And they go through what, what Elisha leads them to do so that it's not deadly to them. But my point in this is not to go to the miracle that, that Elisha did at that point, but to point out that look at what they gathered. From the gourds, from the field, they gathered what would be vegetables. They didn't go out and hunt down game when they were hungry. They went for the the um, easy stuff. <laughs> the easy stuff. <laughs> no, but I mean they could find it easier. Than oh, true. They could find it easier. It was more healthful, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's the same thing. It's yeah. translated stew there. It's translated stew here. A bit later, it's translated lentil. It's all along the same line. It's that type of food. But it is interesting that that's what the prophets were eating. And by the way, lentil stew is still a favorite in Syria and in Egypt, I'm sure in Israel too, but you know, these are areas known for their lentil stew even to this day. Okay, so what we're seeing here in this verse is Yaakov, Jacob, was occupied with the things of the house, okay? Might have been the chef, <laughs> we don't know. But again, typically the things of God. He was in the house, we associate in the house with the godly things, not out in the field with the worldly things. And so Jacob's been cooking the stew, it's been cooking. Remember I told you before, they probably had those pots over a fire outside of the tent that were constantly going and there was constantly stew in it. They just, it never, they never let it go empty. You know, so there's always food being being simmered and cooked and so forth. So Esau comes in from the field and he is exhausted. He is faint. He is famished. Now, he didn't find anything in the field, apparently, to satisfy. And we can draw that spiritual lesson. We're not going to find anything in the world that satisfies. It just isn't. The satisfaction does not come from there. But here we're going to deal with it being his physical appetite. We're going to see that. Esau, verse 30, says to Yaakov, to Jacob, Please, let me have a mouthful of that red stuff, of that red stuff there, for I'm exhausted. He's got to be pointing to it. Give me some of that red stuff. I am so exhausted. I'm so famished. The Hebrew even says, let me devour it. You know when you come in starved and you say, Oh, I could eat a horse. And you feel like you just want to gobble everything down and sometimes you eat too fast and too much and you regret it. This is where he would have been. And calling it that red stuff or that same red pottage or however your, your description comes, the Hebrew says, of this red, of this Adam. Because Adam, the word that we get, Adam, is red because remember he was formed out of the red earth um, and so he was called red. Is it a vegetable or is it a is all along that line. It can be vegetables, lentils, the beans, you know, it's all along that line. It's not the meat, it's the, you know, what grows naturally. I'll put it that way. Okay? So, I, and by the way, we're going to see that Esau later gets associated with the red stuff. He gets uh, nicknamed Edom. Adam and Edom are very close. It's just different vowel markings. And Edom means red. Adam, again, can also mean red or earthy or ruddy. So we have very close wording here. But again, the idea of being called Edom later is because of his fondness for this stew. And yet I bring it out because he's going to be the father of the Edomites. And we hear about that down to today. We looked at our map recently and we saw Moab and Edom that were on the, the south and the east of the area that um, our people are living in in what's called Israel today. So that's why I bring it up. That's really what the name means is red. It doesn't mean that they were red people, but they, they were associated with the red stew. Um, they were more of a ruddy people probably also. Now, it seems that Esau didn't even really know the right name. Just give me that red stuff. The idea, again, when we take it to look for the application, we would say that he was ignorant of spiritual things, that he just didn't, you know, he just didn't know anything when it came to the spiritual. Uh, it could have just been simple, though. It could have just been him saying, you know, this red, 
you know, and it could have been his nickname for it. Oh, that's my favorite red stuff. You know, we'll, we'll use words like that. But once we go through this story and he loses his birthright, which I can't say it that way, I take that back, it wasn't his birthright, but the story of the birthright, I'll put it that way, every time he'd be called Edom, every time he'd be called Red, which is the nickname he's going to get, and, and it doesn't say he became the father of the Esauites, it's he became the father of the Edomites, so you know he was called Edom more, it could have always been a constant reminder that he traded the birthright for that red stuff, that stew, that red stuff, okay? <laughs> Just because we know how the story is going to go. But let's go ahead and go back into our story. He's exhausted, um, and, and in fact, it does go on, it says it here, I forgot it's already here. Therefore, he was called Edom by name, okay? Because he gets associated with the red stuff. He's known for that's the stuff he wanted. So, and I think that has to be because of the story of the birthright that's associated with it. Otherwise, one day calling it something wouldn't make him nicknamed by that. So, Jacob at that moment says, first, sell me your birthright. Now, if Yaakov, if Jacob is to handle the priestly office of the family, if he's going to be the spiritual leader, it makes sense that he should be eating the food for the prophets. He should be eating that red stuff that fits. He had the legal right and the blessings that would go along with a prophet's position is what's being said. But when we look again at that spiritual connotation, what we're saying and what we're seeing is he wanted the spiritual. He was longing for the spiritual. He was longing for those patriarchal blessings not just the blessings, oh, I want double this and double that, but he wanted that spiritual. He wanted to lead the family spiritually. He, want, he had that heart for that. Yitzhak, it seems, is already leaning toward giving to Esau in spite of what God had told Rebecca, Rivka. Because remember, God told her that the younger would be the one that was brought up, that the older would serve the younger. So. I cannot believe that she kept that a secret from her husband. I believe that he had to know. And I do also do not believe that they were talking about the birthright only one time, only at the very moment of, of Isaac ready to give the birthright. But I think as the boys grew, as they were maturing, as they were coming to that point, remember how we saw Laban, Laban took over helping his father before his father was gone? I think that they had everybody in the story knew it was coming time to give that birthright and blessing that Isaac would be giving. And I think that we're already seeing that there was probably comments being made that this is Esau's. But it's not because God said it wasn't. Now, until we have the Aaronic priesthood, and that comes with Moshe, Moses, you know, we're down the line of ways from Jacob. Until that point that, um, I'm gonna call it the priestly position. The father was the priest of the family. The father was the spiritual leader of the family. He exercised those rights. And that's what the birthright would get, is that spiritual heritage usually went to the firstborn. We, we looked before how it doesn't always, there are exceptions. This is going to be one of those exceptions. But usually that birthright was handing over the spiritual lead of the family to that eldest child, um, to the one in the household. Um, I've got Genesis 27, 29. Oh, because that's where Isaac is starting to, to do the blessing. Let's take a sneak peek right there. Let's go to chapter 27 and verse 29 because we won't pick this back up until we get over there uh, but in the blessing that Isaac's giving at the time he's giving that birthright he's saying may people serve you nations bow down to you be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you curse be those who curse you and bless be those who bless you so see he's going to be the one that he's blessing even the nations are going to bow down to him he's going to be over all his brothers if they don't bless them, they won't be blessed. If they curse them, they'll find themselves receiving cursing. So all of that's what's going to go to this one who receives the birthright and blessing. And the spiritual responsibilities were paramount for the priest of the family. 
we see that in chapter 18 and verse 19. So go back with me to Genesis 18 and verse 19. And we see when we read there, and this, of course, is with Abraham. For I have chosen him, Abraham, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep, I lost my place, to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. So right there, God saying, Abraham has been chosen. He is to bless his children in this way, lead them spiritually, his whole household, the children that come after. So Abraham, if he was doing his job, and I think he was, would have been trying to be a spiritual influence over his grandchildren also. He would want to be passing down to them how they need to walk right before their God and they need to be in that right fellowship with God and not be concerned of the things of the world, but be concerned of the things of God. So all of this is tied into this birthright. Keep that in mind. And you can see what Yaakov would be thinking. I can't let that go to my brother. He has no interest. I can't see him leading this family spiritually and doing well by them. He would lead them astray. He doesn't know the things of God. He's not interested in things of God. He's not a man of God. His whole bend is not there. So Isaac, I mean, sorry, Jacob wanting to honor God and have the family honor God and pass it down to his children as it's been passed down to him would be having a tech, you know, that this was paramountly, of paramount importance to him that he wanted it. It would have been the most cherished possession. And in that day, the birthright was the most cherished possession because along with it was the dignity, it was the power. Um, they did get the double portion. Let me show you both of those on, on your way to, we're eventually going to go to Deuteronomy, but on your way, stop off at Genesis 49. In this chapter, we have Yaakov blessing his sons, giving them the blessing that's being passed down. Usually this is done near the, the patriarch's death, and that Jacob thought he was dying at this time. And in verse 3 of chapter 49, he says, Reuben, you are my firstborn. My might, the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity, preeminent in power. So that goes with that firstborn. So Esau is going to be attracted. I want the power. I want the dignity. I want the prestige. I'm going to be the head of the family. But that's only one side of it. There's far more to it than just that. Go on with me to Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter 21. In Deuteronomy 21, we're going to look at verses 15 to 17. In verses 15, it's on it says, If a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, both the loved and the unloved have borne him sons. If the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, then it shall be in the day he wills that he has two sons. He cannot make the son of the loved the firstborn before the son of the unloved. Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17. Okay, and let me read 17 and then I'll summarize it for you. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength. To him belongs the right of the firstborn. What Deuteronomy is telling us is, if a man has two wives, they both have had a firstborn son, he doesn't get to pick which son gets the birthright. Because if he's got a favored wife, he'll pick that favored wife's son. And God says, no, whichever was born first, that's the one that's first born. But notice what they get. They get that dignity. They get the double portion. They get the beginning of strength. And the right belongs to the first born. So again, Esau is fighting for all of that. He wants that first born privileges. But when we look at other scriptures, we see that the the, the um, one who receives this. Why does he get a double portion of lamb? Because his responsibility is he has to take care of his mother when she's a widow. He has to take care of unmarried sisters. And if they never get married, he takes care of them every day of their life. So he's got to have more to be able to give. He's not going to keep everybody living under one roof all cramped. But he could give that unmarried daughter her own tent and give her uh, the field that she'd have 
uh, sustenance for food and, and other things, and he'd oversee her. He'd put an arm around her, he'd protect her from the wolves, <laughs> so to speak. So there's so much responsibility that goes along with that firstborn. It's not just getting the bigger, it's that there for reason, and especially the spiritual leadership. That was tantamount, that was the most important thing. So Esau is firstborn. No argument. He's in the direct line for that Abrahamic promise of the seed. But Abraham's promise of that seed is that the whole earth would be blessed through this seed. Esau doesn't care two hoots about that blessing and what's going to come down the line. We're going to see that he sells that birthright just to gratify his flesh. I'm hungry. I want it now. And so he gives up something that he doesn't care about. We'll, 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 I'll say more about that when we get there, okay? I don't want to get sidetracked. But God knew this would happen. God also knew the character of the two. He knew who was to receive that blessing. He'd already said it, that Jacob was the one that was to receive it. It wasn't to be Esau. Look with me at Romans 9. Romans 9, <clears throat> verses 10 through 13. This is in relation to Israel. Okay, Romans 9, verse 10. Um, yeah, okay. And not only this, but there was Rebecca also. When she conceived twins, Romans 9, yeah. starting verse 10. When she conceived twins by one man, our father gets off. For though the twins were not yet born, had not yet done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as is written, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. And remember we talked about how that's the extreme contrast. His love for Jacob so great it looked as if he hated Esau. It wasn't that he literally hated him. But notice how God said it wasn't because of how they were. It was God's sovereign choice. Before they were born, before they had a chance. So it wasn't that, that um, Isaac and Rebecca could look and say, well, this child deserves it more, that child does not. God said sovereignly, this is who the promise is going to go through. The promise is going to go from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and continue on down in that messianic line. Inherit in this birthright was a covenant God made with Abraham. It was a covenant of land, a covenant of the nation, but it was the covenant of the Messiah. How could God have uh, planned or allowed a worldly, fleshly leader to be part of that plan? Esau didn't value the land. He didn't value the coming seed, the Messiah. That wasn't any of his bent. God did not ever plan for it to go to Esau, and Jacob and, and Rebekah pulled a fast one. No, God had said from the start, it's to go to Jacob. Jacob is the one I have sovereignly made covenant with. So it was God's choice, period. End of argument right there. What it really shows, because God knows the heart, and he knows down the road, so he's already working behind the scenes, getting it ready for the future. We could easily say that, and I'm not disagreeing with it at all, that, it, that God could have said, on the basis of my foreknowledge, because we know that he says that when he predestinates according to his foreknowledge. He knows how those actions will be. Whether whether or not here he didn't say it in that way, but it easily could be God knowing had, had chosen, but also God, it, God's sovereign period. And that's a hard one for us to wrap our minds around and understand that fully. But when you know God is nothing but fair and nothing but just and nothing but righteous and nothing but love, then whatever God chooses is fair and right and just and in love. It's never off. That's why when we look at election, and it is so difficult for people to understand, because no one can ever stand before God and say, I couldn't get saved. You didn't let me. No, God said for he loved the world so that the world, anyone of the world who wanted could receive salvation. 
but the ones who did were the ones that God predestined to, to according to his foreknowledge. And we could have the same thing in action here, like what Loretta is saying. Even apart from that, God is sovereign. He knows. He's fair. He's just. He's right. He rules in love, and he never condemns someone just out of just, just, I'm going to condemn that. He just never does that. He's, we never find anything in scripture with that. The most we see is that the birthright can be given to a younger rather than the elder. We see that. We've seen it already in scripture, and I'll just remind you again. You can look on your own if you want, but again, it's recorded in First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, that if there's a younger that's more deserving, it can go to that one. But regardless of whether it was because Jacob's character was more worthy or because of God's sovereignty, it's, they're both, it, both are true. God is sovereign. He said it was going to Jacob. It was going to Jacob. He gave Jacob a heart that would respond to him, and Jacob did, so he did deserve it. But that's the after effect. I don't want you to think that, that Esau lost because he didn't deserve. God just didn't let him gain because he didn't deserve. Okay. Uh, since the blessings and stuff like that go to the firstborn, do you do they where does this happen? And do you let the kids kind of grow up and see where they're going where does this one more interested in God than the other one? Or 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 how does that work? Apparently it does give room for them to see the character of the children tablet I'm sorry and sorry I'm trying to get to the verse to be able to read it for you there we go okay I'm gonna to go to first chronicles um, to help answer it first chronicles chapter 5 okay now the sons of Reuben the firstborn of Israel he for he was firstborn because he defiled his father's bed his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he's not enrolled in the genealogy according to the birthright. Through, though Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came the leader, yet the birthright belonged to Joseph. So what we're being told in those verses is Reuben was the firstborn out of the 12 kids. He should have had the birthright, but because he had lived, he had a, a very... He defiled his father's bed, okay? If you don't know the history, he, he had uh, relations with his father's concubine or, or you know, um, Rachel's handmaid, excuse me. That disqualified him. He was not of the character and the caliber spiritually, so he was overlooked and it went down to another. Um, and in this case, we see it was given to the sons of Joseph. You're gonna see when we get to the sons of Joseph, He's got two sons, and the same thing happens. When his father, our, our grandfather Jacob goes to bless them, his hands are on the wrong one, according to the blessing. The younger will receive the greater blessing than the older. Yes, there was room for them. Now, both those times, though, I'm sorry, I'm all over the page. Both those times it was God-ordained. But the family could, as the children were being raised, if they saw the older child was irresponsible, would not be a good caretaker of the family name and all that goes with it, they did have that freedom to go ahead and look past that, that firstborn. But it would be such a blight on that firstborn that unless they really didn't deserve it, it probably wouldn't have been done. If they were you know, close alike, um, even if the younger had some extra strengths in other areas, but the first was still good, it still would have just stayed with the first one. So we see it as exception to the rule, not common. You know, not common, but they did have that ability to see that. The birthright would be passed down sometime close to the father's death. Um, if the father was very ill, they thought that, you know, death was coming, it would be done, and then let's say the father resurges, it'd still be, it's already done. So, but it, it wouldn't be done when the children were three, it'd be done, you know, close to the father's death. Um, with Jacob and Esau, we know they're <coughs> close to 20 years of age. So they've, they've grown up, they've matured, they're young men, they're beginning to, to show what their character's going to be like for how they are going to be doing things. But notice 
Isaac isn't even judging according to that. If he were, he would have to have been saying, Esau is not a good candidate. You know, especially since we're talking about the Messianic line. You know, this is critically important. I have to see too that the covenant of Abraham that was passed on to me, I pass it down to faithful hands that will continue to teach it, lead the family in it, and preserve it. So he, if he was doing that, he would have been saying, hmm, this really should be going to Yaakov. But there was no room for him to question. He had been told. Rivka was told before they were even born. And God made it clear before they even acted. He saw it worldly and Jacob spiritually. God had ordained it. God had said it. This is the way it is to be. So it's possible that uh, Isaac, because of his age, he's just, he just got off. I'm not going to say because of his age, but yes, I think he got a little bit off track. I think that his his fleshly um, ap appetite was there also. In his flesh, he wanted to pass down the double portion and that headship to his rugged son, not his meek and mild son. So, yeah. I, I really do think he was off. And I'll show you why I think he realized, too, when we get there. It sounds like their marriage went from bliss to blister. <laughs> <laughs> and says it sounds like their marriage went from bliss to blister. <laughs> I'll let you read into that exactly how you want. <laughs> but uh, I think I've covered well. By the way, the Hebrew word for birthright is bechora, if you hear that. That's the... the firstborn, the privileges and advantages to be that priest over the family, the head of the family, overseeing the younger sons, overseeing the, the unmarried daughters, the widowed mother if she, you know, if the father does go first, the double portion is theirs, and they had the judicial authority of the father. So if the father had influence in other areas, maybe he was at the town he had a bit of influence, the son would step into that role the son would get that position also. Again, another reason why we know um, Yitzhak was a leader. We're going to see that in the next chapter. So another reason why it was of, of tabernacle importance that this be passed down to the spiritual, not to the worldly minded. But um, isn't that a, a still bond? I mean, it still enters to the firstborn? It should be. I mean, not that it always happens. But it, but should it still go to the firstborn? Yes, it, it normally should. Yeah except there can be exceptions. That's all I'm pointing out. But yes, it, it normally would. But if you stop and think, he's not worthy of it. You know, no, but I mean, now days, even, even oh, us now. Oh, oh, OK. Nowadays, often, yes, you'll still see the, the firstborn out of the children given that role of responsibility a bit more, yes. Maybe not necessarily with double inheritance and that sort of thing, but still. You know, and in some cases, maybe so. In the, in the Jewish families, it would still be so, you know, because the ones that are still Orthodox and trying to follow this. And what they needed to see and understand, too, is this covenant was the relationship with Yahweh. You know, that's what they're, they're looking at. That would put this one in that spiritual covenant. Remember, if they weren't in the Commonwealth of Israel, if they didn't keep this, the commandments when the commandments were given, they'd be cut off from Israel. It was of, of extreme importance that this be kept spiritual. What, you know, we're taught later, it's in 1 Corinthians 6, that we're not to unequally marry, that we're not to marry a believer with an unbeliever because there isn't any fellowship. The two can't walk together. The unbeliever will pull the believer down and the decisions will not be wise and spiritual decisions in this also, to carry on the covenant promises, to have that relationship with Jehovah, do you think Esau cared about that? No, it doesn't show you know, that he did. So even from the human standpoint, Isaac should not have wanted Esau to get it. But God's saying, I chose it before even that was a fact. Okay? And the mother paid dearly for interfering because she never got to see the son. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah, but we'll get there when we get there. Okay, so let's see what Esau has to say. Jacob's laid down. You want my stew? I want your birthright. Okay, so 
Um, we're in verse 31 that Jacob said, first tell me your birthright. How did Esau respond? Okay, did he think? Did he, I, sorry, I found my place. I was looking for my place. He, he thought with his stomach, yeah, okay. He says, look, I'm about to die. So what use then is this birthright to me? The Hebrew says, I am going to die, or I'm going to meet death. Now, we can take it two ways, okay? Either he's saying, I'm so hungry, I'm gonna die. What good is the birthright? You can have it. Or he was saying, you know, I'm gonna die one day anyway. What does it matter, you know? Have your birthright. What does that matter to me? Either way, it shows his attitude toward it. Um, he wasn't, you know, he was basically saying when I'm dead, birthright's not gonna count at anything. It's not going to matter at all. It doesn't get me any kudos in heaven. We don't see the oldest go to heaven and get double portion in heaven, in other words. So either way he was looking at it, either saying I'm immediately going to die if I don't get it and what good is it for me when I'm dead, or even, well, one day I'll be dead and that won't matter anyway, so who cares? All he cared about was the here and now. He didn't care about the eternal. He didn't care about the spiritual. He felt like he could live on those promises. All he valued was his sensual enjoyment. His was flesh. his flesh, yes. Mm -hmm. That was more important to him than the spiritual. Now, was Esau at the point of starvation? Was he really ready to die? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, even if he were thinking he was that weak and that vulnerable, he's got a father and a mother. What parent wouldn't take care of a child that was too sickly to feed himself? Would not that parent step in? He could have gone at either one of them. He had that, he went past that pot probably into the tent on his way in to talk to Jacob. If he was starving to death, why didn't he stop and help himself to bowl himself? Why does he come on in? I think there's a little more play going on with this attitude here that we're going to see. But bottom line, no matter what, no matter how he meant it, whether he meant immediately or whether he meant future, he just showed that all he cared about was his appetite. Uh, birthright didn't mean a thing to him. So Yaakov sees that. He doesn't care about that birthright. And he says, first swear to me. So he swore an oath to him and sold his birthright to Yaakov. Okay, um, Jacob's making sure. He wants to the deal signed, sealed, and delivered. <laughs> He's saying, I don't want you know you to be able to say one day, well, I never said that. I didn't say I was giving it to you. So he wanted him to swear, to make an oath that, that would hold up in court, so to speak, that yes, he did say I'm, I'm giving the birthright to Esau. Now, it's very interesting because as one of my sources said, and I liked it, Jacob tried to purchase what was already his. And Esau <laughs> tried to sell something that he didn't have. <laughs> so both these boys are not in the right place. Neither one are where they should be because if Jacob was trusting the Lord, he wouldn't have been feeling like, I gotta do something to get it. But Esau, again, is still revealing that he's not even willing to buy by what God has said because he would know it wasn't supposed to be his also. I think all four family members knew what God had told Rebecca. But isn't it possible that Isaac did not take the time from God to teach his sons before they got that age? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, but what I was asking, is it possible that Isaac did not teach his sons before they got to that age? I think the fact that Jacob had a spiritual heart, there was spiritual food in the house, whether it was out of Isaac or out of Rebecca or out of both of them. And I don't think Isaac was that far off for a long time. I think it was a slow, but sure. I think he was like Abraham. He had his good times spiritually. He had his times when he, oops, and then he got back right with the Lord again. So I don't think he neglected. I don't think the boys were unknowing. I think that they were raised being told what it was to be. And I think that Esau thought, I'll get it anyway. When I, when I read that, to me, it's like people that don't care about spiritual things. Salvation, they say, they want the world. And 
later on when it tells how um, Esau wept bitterly. And we'll think talk about, about what we stand before the Lord. We don't care about spiritual things now, but when we stand before the Lord, we're going to weep bitterly. And notice what you said. If you can hear Anne, let me repeat. She's saying how um, there are those who do want to be saved, but then they care more about the world than about spiritual things. And yet one day they'll stand before the Lord, and as Esau is going to regret this the way he is here, those people will, will regret there also. And I, I will agree with you. What I want to point out, even though it's ahead of time, Esau regretted he didn't repent. Esau didn't ever come to the point where he said, I want the spiritual. He has regretted what he lost. He, it was, there's a whole different, when we get there, I'll go through the Hebrew with you, but the heart wasn't there. The heart just never was there, you know. So um, there's a regret and there's a repentance, and you need both. You need to repent and be right before the Lord, and we don't see that Esau did that. He just... He regretted losing the the, the value. The value. Yeah, yeah. But we also totally agree with you, um, and that there will be those who will be sorrowful for not having done for the Lord while they had opportunity. And we don't want to be among that. We want to do all that we can for the Lord here and now. So we see that Esau um, is being told, swear it. You know, in other words, give me your John Hancock on the contract swearing, uh, holding up the right hand, however they did it, making that oath was what stood in that day. You know, Jacob didn't go run get pen and paper. They didn't have such a thing. But if it was done today, that's probably what he would have done. Here, I'm, I've already written out for you that you're giving to me and just sign your <laughs> name. You know, but again, it wasn't on the basis of this that it happens anyways, on the basis of what God said. So, um, first swear to me so he swore an oath to him and sold his birthright to Jacob so even though it wasn't his to give he acted as if it was and he sold it to Jacob even though Jacob should have waited on the Lord he probably felt like good I've got what you know is so important to me and what I, I know I, I needed to have so Jacob followed through he gave Esau bread and lentil stew see how it's called lentil stew here again the veggies the, the beans the natural not, not a meat um, st staple, but the, the veggies. He ate and he drank and he got up and he went on his way. Now, does that sound like someone who was on the verge of death? <laughs> One meal brought him back. Wow. A few minutes earlier, he was dying, you know. So, but notice how he didn't even contest Jacob for it. He didn't argue. He didn't say, well, let's, I'll give you this part of it. Or, you know, he just, fine, have it. He didn't care about any of it. So he just gave it away. We're told in Hebrews he despised it. And that's a strong word. Let me take you to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And we'll read verses 16 and 17. As soon as Rashad can get her fingers to type right so that her tablet can go where she wants it to. There we go. Hebrews 12, verses 16 and 17. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau. Wow. That's how God calls Esau, immoral and godless. Who sold his birth, own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. So he cried for the birthright. He begged his dad for the birthright. He wanted to receive the blessing, but there was no repentance. There was nothing in his heart that said, I've been wrong before God. I, I need to get my life right before God. I need to come back into the fellowship with God. We, we don't read that at all. And it says here that he despised his birthright. That, that um, uh, well, I guess it said it earlier. But anyway, that, that he was immoral and godless and that he only desired the blessing, no repentance, and the tears didn't work. You know, a lot of times tears work on a person's heartstrings, but they didn't hear. 
Uh, but that's later. We'll see that later. So, um, oh, where it says that he despised it was it back in Genesis. And uh, the chapter, Genesis 35, the end, 25, sorry, the end of verse 34. So Esau despised his birthright. He got up after he ate and he went off as if nothing had ever happened, as if nothing had changed, didn't matter at all. Now, I don't know whether he even gave it a second thought. We don't see that he did in scripture. We get the idea that he had no heart for godly things, that he lightly valued it. Even if he had thought and thought, well, I'll get it because I can do what I want to do. You know, I'll find my way. I'll get it from dad. Who knows? But he just lived for the moment. He lived for the moment. That was it. Now, a man like that who's going to be described by God as godless and as immoral could never be qualified to inherit God's covenant promises and the spiritual responsibilities that are attached to that because they, those go hand in hand. No heart. No heart. And later we see also Esau's descendants, Edom. We're going to see that they had the same type of thinking that he had shown. They had total disregard for Israel. They had total disregard for Jehovah, God's program for his people. Let me give you one example. Go with me to Numbers by Midbar, Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. The same way I see Kion, Cain's line continually evil, Ham, him, his line evil, I see also Esau's line in that same way. Numbers chapter 20, and we're going to verses 14 and following. Now this is... Um, they're on their way, the children of Israel are on their way near to enter into the promised land. The most has raised, been raised up, brought them out of Egypt, and they're going through. From Kadesh, Moses then sent messengers to the king of Edom. Kadesh Barnea is where the spies said that the land was... Verse 1, right? Uh, no, we're looking at verse 14. Um, was where the t t 10 spies gave the bad report. I'll put that, okay? So near the time... Now, from Kadesh, Moses then sent messengers to the king of Edom. Remember Edom? The Edomites came from Esau. Okay, so this head of Edom, this king, um, Moses sends a messenger. And it says, thus your brother Israel. Now that's still right. Esau and Jacob were brothers. So even though we've gone down the line, they're, they're kissing cousins. Okay, they're the same family that we've got the Edomites come from Esau and we've got the Israelites will come from Jacob. Okay, but they're still the same family. So thus your brother Israel has said, you know all the hardship that has befallen us, that our fathers went down to Egypt, we stayed in Egypt a long time, the Egyptians treated us and our fathers badly, but when we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice, he sent an angel, he brought us up out from Egypt. Now behold, we are at Kadesh, a town on the edge of your territory. Please, let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or through vineyard. We'll not even drink water from a well. We'll go along the king's highway. We won't turn to the right or the left until we pass through your territory. So, Israel representative went to the head of Edom, the tribe that was living right there, and said, we need to just pass through your territory. We're on our way to the promised land. We're, we're going as what God has promised. All we're asking is, let us pass through your territory. We won't take one grape out of your vineyard. We won't drink one sip of water out of your wells. We'll not cost you anything. We'll not give you any problems. Just please let us travel through. They, they wanted to go the straight route. Okay, Edom, verse 18, responds and says to him, You shall not pass through us, or I will come out with the sword against you. Again, the sons of Israel said to him, We will go up by the highway. If I and my livestock do drink any of your water, I'll pay the price. Let me only pass through on my feet, nothing else. But he said, You shall not pass through. And Edom came out against him with a heavy force and a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to allow Israel to pass through his territory. So Israel turned away from him. And Israel had to go around the long way rather than straight through. Now, verse 22, when they set out from Kadesh, the sons of Israel, the whole congregation came to Mount Hor. 
So they're able to go on, but they couldn't go straight through. They couldn't go through Edom's territory. They had to go the long way around. Edom did not do right by his brother here, and judgment falls on him for that. Go with me to, in your English, Obadiah. It's Ovadia in our Hebrew, which sounds quite a bit different, but Obadiah for your English. There's only one chapter, but if you're using a tablet, you still have to put in chapter 1 to get to the right place. So Ovadia 1, verse 1. The vision of Ovadia, thus says the Lord concerning Edom. Okay, God gave a vision to Obadiah about Edom. We've heard a report from the Lord, and uh, 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 oh, try it again. Sorry, an envoy has been sent among the nations, saying, "Arise, let us go against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you." It goes on. Let me jump down. Let's go to verse ten. So this is coming against Edom now. Why? Here's verse ten. Because of violence to your brother Jacob. You will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. So the Edomites were held responsible for cutting off Israel, not allowing the children of Jacob, Israel, to go through their land since they had to go around. God is saying judgment will come on them. You did not help Israel. You will be judged for it. You're going to be cut off forever. There's still the area called Edom that we know that, that is Arab territory. That we don't even really hear the Edomites today. And yet even the territory Edom will be gone in the future. Go with me to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 25. Ezekiel 25. I will just say anyone who thinks they can cross God, look out. Okay. Um, Ezekiel 25 starting with verse 12. Thus says the Lord God, because Edom has acted against the house of Judah, against Judah, even though that's that's later. We see the Esau came against Jacob. We're going to see Esau's children come against Jacob's children, Judah being one of his children, by taking vengeance and has occurred grievous guilt and avenged themselves upon them. All this Edom did to Judah. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off man and beast from it. I will lay it waste from Timon even to Dedan. They will fall by the sword. I will lay my vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel. Therefore they will act in Edom according to my anger and according to my wrath. Thus they will know my vengeance, declares the Lord God. And during the tribulation time we will see that area trampled under the foot of the Lord Messiah in his return. We'll see it come to a complete end. We see a precursor before, but a complete destruction of it then. Now what about the Palestinians? They feel they're, they're part of the Bible, they're part of Israel, but they're not. Are they? There is no such thing as Palestinian, even though they call themselves that. The land called Palestine was a misnomer, a misname for the land of Israel. They took the land of Israel, the Romans, and they took the name Philistia, Philistia, the Philistines, Israel's first enemy. And when they overran Israel, they, they were doing all they could to just poke at Israel. So they said, we're even going to change the name of the country. We're going to call it Palestine. They changed the name of Jerusalem to Aelina Capitolina. They, they did all kinds of things just to try to wipe out any memory of Israel and of the Jewishness that has a right to that land. Now, you didn't call a rose a violet, and it's still a rose. There's no other way to put it. You call Israel by any other name, it is still Israel. And God will, because he promised, never make a full end of Israel. He will redeem Israel. So those who are saying, well, it's our land, we're Palestinians. Well, let's go back a little further than the time of Rome when they put that name on, which is first century A.D. Let's go back here, which we're back, oh my goodness, we're about 2000 B.C. and around figures. So for 2,000 years, this land that they're claiming is theirs belonged to Jacob, belonged to his descendants, belonged to Isaac, belonged to Abraham. It's the area that God said, I will give to the children of Israel. I will cast seven nations out of this land. They're in it now, but they're being kicked out because of how evil they are. And I'll give you, Israel, this land. 
I'll put my name on it, on Jerusalem in particular, and I will do this forever. So now I'll ask you what, quote, Palestinian has a right to say this land is theirs. And what is God going to kick them out now? Because they've been really hindering and causing wars, small little wars. With them. When the Lord returns well, at the God. end of the Battle of Armageddon, he will clean that land again of all who are in rebellion against him. All of the enemies will be put under his footstool. And at that time, Israel will become the head nation with Yeshua sitting on David's throne in Jerusalem, ruling the entire world. All the nations will come up for blessing or not receive blessing if they don't. So when the Lord has his final say, all of those Arab countries will be thrust out of any of the area that God gave to Israel, which is much larger than the Israel on our map is today. We saw the, the boundaries in chapter 15, and we'll talk about them again at another time, that all of that land will belong to Israel, to the Jewish nation, with their king sitting on his throne. They have their kingdom now. They have their, throne sitting, their king sitting on the throne. There will be other nations. Egypt is one of the nations mentioned. She will suffer consequences for 40 years, but then later she's going to be able to come up and receive blessing from God. So those displaced Palestinians who are really of Arab descent, if they are right with the Lord, they will have blessing in the millennium also. But if they're enemies of the Lord, they'll be put under. And there are those who God will make a total end of. Um, that will not be seen even in the millennial time because God said, I'm making a full end of them. And he does it because of their sin. You know, so, um, but we now get to you in one second. Dora had a question before Loretta got in there. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, when, when the Lord says, I'll, I'll cut you off, that means God's no blessing from God. No blessing from God, yes. Yeah, cut off is, is cut off. And no blessing from nothing. No, when he says, I'm cutting you off, if he says, I'm cutting them off forever, they're cut off forever. The same way you're saved forever. Forever is forever, no matter whether it's on a good side or a bad side, forever is forever. So yes, they're, they're cut off forever. Does that mean all of the people? No, in the same way not all of Israel will inherit Israel. Only the religious, spiritual, let me not call them religious, only the spiritual that are right with the Lord will inherit the land at that time to go into the millennium. The, the rebellious will be cleaned out also. Because the promises go to the remnant who believe. Rowena. Roger's trying to. You're still not there. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm reminded of the unkindness of Edom when Israel was passing through to enter the promised land to the day of uh, the great tribulation when the Lord said that uh, those who have shown unkindness to the Jewish people like those who were hungry were not fed and those who were thirsty were not given water and uh, that was one of the guidelines for you to enter the millennial kingdom or not your yes. kindness towards the Jew at that time right right because in all honesty the only ones who will be kind and extend that kind of help to the Jew are going to be believers the others won't stick their neck out. They, they know that it means their death, and so they won't be willing to do that. But a believer, it, just as we see believers martyred through the time, are willing to take that stand, stand right for Israel. I see the example of the righteous Gentiles in the Holocaust that put their lives on the line to hide Jewish people. It's the same idea. Who did that? Those who, who knew their God. They're the ones that, that who did that. So, yes. Totally agree. This is a sample beforehand. It'll be a greater um, fulfillment in, in the tribulation slash going in the millennial time. But exactly right, Rowena. Yeah. Patty. Um, when you say the Palestine and the Palestinians, could you tell me again, it was the Philistines? The, the Romans were in control. This is about 130 A.D., maybe go to 133 A.D., because you have your last revolt of Jewish people, the third round. The temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. You have another battle with the Jewish people. They're being pushed further and further out. 
by this point, by 100 AD, you're not finding any Jews in the land of Israel or they're dead Jews, you know, they're hiding, running for their lives. By 133, or one, yeah, I think it's 133, you have the Bar Kokhba revolt, which they believe was the last um, big uprising against Rome. And they've, so they've squashed everybody now in, in relation to Israel. And Rome is saying, Titus is saying, I've won. They, he's got his arch of triumph. He's marched the Jews as slaves into um, Rome. And again, they feel like they, they've overrun this area now. So they're in charge of that area now. They're the victors. We can call this area anything we want to call it. So we're not going to call it Israel. We're going to call it Palestinia or Palestine is what it comes down to. Palestina is very close in the Greek and in the, the languages of the time to the word Philistine. That's why Rome chose it. They knew Israel's history. The first enemy that came against Israel were the Philistines. The Philistines were thorn in Israel's flesh all along. You've got Goliath out of the Philistines. The, you know, you have trouble with the Philistines. So Rome took the name of Israel's, I'm going to call it their first real enemy in the land. Rome took that, that name and said, we're going to call it, and they just slightly changed it. Okay. Instead of Philistine, Palestine, Palestine. Okay. You know, so it was a slur on Israel. It was just a slight you know, variation and a name change. Remember, like in <coughs> Hebrew, we, just, we don't even have vowels. We just have markings. So just slight changes. But Israel was called Israel by God in Scripture. It's called Israel or Zion. Zion, uh, Z-I-O-N, Zion, is a name for Israel, for Jerusalem, but it's a name that the two are synonymous. But you don't see God call this land Palestine. He never did. And he said that there are um, those in the land, and he names them, you know, the seven nations that will be thrust out. The Philistines were one that would be thrust out. But it was just Rome's way of poking them, you know. We're not only your controllers, we're going to call the name by your ancient enemy. You know, in other words, it'd almost be like calling them, when they rise up in the tribulation, it'd almost be saying, we're Hitlerites. What Hitler didn't finish, we'll finish. Almost like that. The Philistines didn't finish it off, but we're here in their memory doing it for them. You know, and just, just... It, it annihilate, erase anything Jewish connected to the land so that they would, could even say Jerusalem isn't the eternal capital that's Aelina Capitolina that was a Roman name you know. and I don't remember what it translates into but it was just and, and today those of that type of mindset they still do it Rachel's tomb wasn't Rachel's tomb it was a mosque it was a Muslim mosque now that tomb is about 3500 BC, I think, if I remember my time right. And there wasn't such a thing as Muslim to 600 AD. So how can something that can be tested to be so much older be a mosque and not a Jewish tomb? <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. But you speak a lie loud enough and long enough that people believe it. And right now they're doing the same thing. When things are found on the Temple Mount that show that, that the Jewish people were there, these coins that are being found that I get so excited over because it's another proof of the Word of God, they find an excuse and they try to say this isn't what it says it was. And they try to erase every connection that the Jewish people had to the land. Because in the Arab mindset that is opposed to Israel, if we can cut off any rights to that land, then we've got it. It's ours. We were there first. Hello? Really? Really? You were there first? Yes, there were as a people and they called Philistines that were there, but that's not who your relatives are. You're coming out of Eden, probably. You're coming out of others because God made an end of those, those countries that he did cast out. So, don't they say, oh, go ahead. No, don't, don't they say even now the story says that that land was empty and desolated until the Muslims, they, yeah, yes, yes, came in and they right wars and stuff like that. Right, they wanted. but it's not true. You go into history and you will find, you know, the, um, the historians that wrote during the time. There's no, always but been. I do know that the land that it was given to Jacob and stuff like that. But I mean, in 
before they really established uh, Israel that it was nobody <coughs> wanted that peace. Or nobody wanted the land around or whatever. Well, before it became Israel, there were seven nations living in it. Oh. The seven that, that Joshua and his people were to thrust out of the land. So there were nations living there. And there it, was Mark Twain when he walked through there. Much he, later, yeah. He, he mentioned that it was a, most of swamp land. Yes. You know, that, yes. No That's to. much later. Right. Oh, Mark okay. Twain is yeah. what 1800s, but yes, he talked about how denuded the land was because Rome did. Rome cut down every tree. You know, they they just mercilessly went through the land and denuded it as much as possible. But even like we saw back in the day of Jeremiah when they went into captivity and they left behind the weak and the elderly and the beggarly. You know. God always kept a few, and there was always, you know, it, his name was on it. It was his. Even when it was lying dormant, so to speak, it was still God's, and who God said it was, and who God said he was giving it to. He's always kept a few. Even when they went into captivity, there were still Jewish people who had a right to that land. Remember Jeremiah, buy the land, put the deed in the, the clay pot. It's going to be there for the others when they come back. So, you know, God's way of showing no matter what, it's still Israel's. Even when you thrust them out and I let them go out of their land because of their rebelliousness, still I will bring them back. The ones that he didn't bring back are those seven nations that they were to thrust out because he said, I'll make a full end of them. <clears throat> That's why some of these that we hear in history, in our Bible, we don't know of those people today. Hittites, Amalekites. You know, we don't know of them. So, um, but they were enemies, right? The Hittites and all those were enemies of God, yeah, enemies of Israel. Joshua. Oh. Yes, yes, yeah, all the way back, yes, yes. And God did say, you know, when He was bringing Israel in, they're being thrust out because of how evil they are. And really, if I remember, I even warns Israel, don't be evil because you'll be thrust out. He does tell them that in the, as he laid out the law. If you don't keep it, there are consequences. And we see that. The, the ten northern went off into Assyria. The two southern get caught by, or um, cap, captured by uh, Babylon. You know, because they were in rebellion to their God. They weren't being obedient to their God. So he allowed them to suffer the consequences. The Muslims also claim that it was Ishmael that Abraham took up. Right. The right. For the sacrifice. Yes. As Patty just brought out, the Arab nations also say that it's Ishmael that Abraham um, took up to Mount Moriah, uh, Moriah, the, where he offered up, um, we know it to be Isaac. They say it was Ishmael. Yes. That's where we stand on the inerrancy of the Word of God. The Word of God tells us the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. If the Word of God says it was Isaac, it was Isaac. Their books that record that it was Ishmael are not inerrant. They're not, you know, you can't put them on the same level. And I can't because I'm not scholarly enough to read Arabic to be able to say, but I can tell you even the parts of the Quran and all that I've read, it's, it's so different. It's not anything like our scriptures. But uh, our scriptures tell it as it was. Um, there's external evidence to prove. There's internal evidence to prove. Nothing else. No other written by man ever has that kind of 100% proof positive. So even though they say it, it was not Ishmael. Yes. Yeah. Ishmael had been cast out with his mother before that time, remember? Yes, Roger. When you were talking about the Palestinians, that even before Israel came in to become a nation in Israel, that land was part of Jordan and the Arab areas. There was no Palestinian even at that time. They never called themselves Palestinians. No. Even they, though it said no. it was Palestine, but it, it was, they weren't a Palestinian, they were Arab. Right, right. When they called it Palestine, then in 1964, Arafat. Arafat yeah. is the one who who ignited that name and started using the name. Oh, we're the Palestinians. We're the, the we're the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. We're going to liberate the land of Palestine. 
and they started speaking and using that name, it caught on, and by the time you get to today, it's a name that's common, and so common that people want to say, oh, well, I'm Palestinian, that's my land called Palestine. Yeah. They don't even know that there never was a land. It never had a government. It never had all the things that needs to be to be declared a nation. It didn't yeah. have it. And even today, they're still fighting for it. Um, they don't have that standard because it's not. But they are made up of the Palestinian people, quote, the Palestinian people today are made up of the different Arab nations. If they were able to research their roots, they'll find where they came from. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and even if it, they were born in the land called Israel, because there are Israeli Arabs that go back a number of generations mm -hmm. in that land, it still was not the land that was their own, it was they were in Israel's land. You know, so, yes, it's all misnomer. There is no such thing. But, uh, and there are 22 Arab nations, so there's plenty of different lines for them to come through. Yes, okay, Dora. How many years after uh, Abraham and all of those people did the uh, what's the name of the guy that had that vision that the Muslim person? Okay, well, um, Muhammad, the Muslim prophet, lived in the 7th century, which is 600 to 700 A.D. And, and he just had a vision, and people believed that instead of what God went through all that. Because, like that. because yeah. yeah, because man so wants to not believe in God that he'll swallow the lies. The same way that you have, um, okay, I don't mean to offend, but I have to speak truth, okay? The Mormons say, you know, that Moroni, you know, gave these golden uh, scriptures, I can't, I don't want to call them scripture, tablets, you know, to their prophet, and that's what everything stems from. Okay. Thousands of years yeah, later. I tell everybody, but nobody has died for you. Right. None of them has says, I'm going to right, no. be crucified for God's the only one who sends his son to die that we might live. All these others send their sons yeah. to die that they might live. <laughs> you know, so yes, no. No, but none of them have the roots. None of them have, um, you know, I mean, ours goes back to the scriptures, and in the world that does not want to accept the Bible and the right to the Bible, or the right that the Bible gives, that I tell them, well, then you take that up and you argue with God, because God is sovereign, God created, God gave to whom he gave to, you know, so you've got to take it up with God. You can't say, oh, well, I don't like the word of God, so I'm going to throw that out. No, it's historically proved accurate. You know, you give it a chance, if you deal with it honestly and fairly, it proves itself accurate. There's no lie in there. There's nothing, you know, like we're saying, we can call out the, the Mormon belief. We can call out these other beliefs. We can call out what Arafat said, because here's proof of positive. You can't call out what the Bible says. It cannot show the Bible to be wrong. Oops. <laughs> okay, we've gone a little off, but it's very important. I don't mind that. Um, I hope no one else did. Let me just summarize real quick because of the time. Um, we're right there at our last. We'll pick up the next chapter, obviously, next week. Maybe I did. I say I did. We, so Esau despised his birthright, and we talked about how he didn't repent. So I guess really we have tied it up. I'll probably just in a nutshell refer to this because really we'll get back into this when we pick up in Chapter 27 when um, Yitzhak goes to give the birthright to Esau. We'll see what happens then. We'll judge the characters then. In the meantime, we're going to see a little bit more of Yitzhak and where Yitzhak is, what he is, um, how he is in relation to his walk with the Lord and so forth. The same way we followed Abraham, we're going to be following Yitzhak, Isaac. Okay. And that's where we'll pick up in chapter 27 next week well, because... Sorry, we're picking up in 26 next week, but that's what tells us about Isaac, okay? 26 starts out that there's famine in the land, uh, so Isaac goes to Gerar, okay? That's where we're going to pick up. So this episode between Jacob and Esau have taken place, and now the next on the stage of history that we need to know about 
is we're going to see what does Isaac do when there's famine in the land. Anyone remember what Abraham did when there was famine in the land? He went to Egypt. He went to Egypt. <laughs> does that give you a hint of what we're going to see? <laughs> was it the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? And if you got my text, oh well, you're going to have to wait till next week to find out what I mean by oh well, <laughs> that we're going to be talking about the wells. <laughs> so, um, so 26 is very important historically. Uh, it gives us the continuity as our story moves on. That is going to be important also just to see Isaac and his spiritual walk with the Lord the same way we saw Abraham. Um, yeah, I, I did all of this. So, um, yeah, and I guess I could say this next week too, but what I do did want to bring out with the birthright is Jacob's actions weren't out of greed and he didn't blackmail Esau. Esau was not at his mercy. But what do we see with Jacob? A lack of faith in trusting his God to work it out God's way. He felt like he needed to help God. I think we all tend to do that at times and need to watch it and learn from that. God doesn't need our help. If he's made a promise, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. That's where we'll pick back up. We'll, I'll review that last paragraph, but that's my final to tie this up. Say, is, be still and know I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Yes. It, it's Amen. interesting they don't say there was any witnesses to that transaction between Esau. Right, right. I don't believe there was. When <coughs> Jacob made Esau swear an oath, I think that's the closest that they had is, is Jacob could say one day, Esau... You swore, you made an oath, you raised your hand because there, that was binding in that day. But, uh, but that's not the way it's going to go down. But yes, I don't think there were any witnesses. I don't think mom and dad were around or anybody else. You know, I think it was just between the brothers. So any other questions or comments? I hope you found the discussion interesting. Okay, I got one, uh-huh. <laughs> I'm getting a couple more now. Okay, okay. Let's close in a word of prayer, and then we can open it up for more discussion or whatever. Lord God, we thank you that you are sovereign, that you are in control, and that it is your will and your way because it is what is best. Your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts and our thoughts. And we thank you that they are because then we realize you are not a small God on our level that we can form with our hands or make or... or uh, choose to be according to our liking, but you are who you say you are, the most high God, the one true and living God, and that you are the one who created it all, even this universe. You are the one who will keep it in order that it will perform what you have declared from before its inception. Almighty God, how powerful you are, and how great and how mighty, and yet how gentle and loving with us. Thank you. We praise you. Hallelujah. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Yeshua Jesus. Amen. Amen.